Hello and welcome to the class in which we're going to study the, the book of Daniel, the man Daniel. And because all of Scripture is related to the other books of Scripture, we'll gain a deeper appreciation for the different books of the Bible and uh, how they all relate to each other. I like this song in our hymn book that we use here. Standing by a purpose true, heeding God's command. Honor them, the faithful few, all hail to Daniel's band. Verse two, mighty, many mighty men are lost, daring not to stand, who for God had been a host by joining Daniel's band. Many giants, great and tall, stalking through the land, headlong to the earth would fall if met by Daniel's band. Hold the gospel banner high, on to victory grand, Satan and his host defy and shout for Daniel's band. The chorus, dare to be a Daniel, dare to take a stand, dare to have a purpose true, dare to have a purpose f uh, firm. All right, scratch that, I'm gonna start over. Hello and welcome to this class that's going to be about the man, Daniel, and about the book of Daniel. I like this song in our songbook. Standing by a purpose true, heeding God's command, honor them, the faithful few, all hail to Daniel's band. Many mighty men are lost, daring not to stand, who for God had been a host by joining Daniel's band. Many giants, great and tall, stalking through the land, headlong to the earth would fall if met by Daniel's band. Hold the gospel banner high, on to victory grand. Satan and his host defy, and shout for Daniel's band. The chorus, dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone, dare to have a purpose firm, dare to make it known. I've enjoyed studying the book of Daniel, and I hope that you will enjoy this trip through the book that we're about to take. I'll begin with uh, an introduction for this class period. Um, some criticism against this book. Many say the the prophecy is too correct and too exact. I, I know when they talk about the, the faith of a child, it's, it's funny because a child would have the correct answer right away. The ignorance of childlike faith and the ignorance, of course, uh, because the scholastic men of this world would laugh at the young person that would say, too correct? too exact, but if God is all-knowing and is not bound by time, shouldn't his words be absolutely correct and absolutely exact? The scholar looks down his nose at the young person and says, come back when you're more wise. I would say to that young person, don't come back to that person. Enjoy your belief in an all-knowing God. Charles uh, Boutflower said, The critics look upon the book of Daniel as a religious novel, resting upon a shadowy background of history, written about 164 B.C., so hundreds of years after when it was written, in the troublous days of the Maccabees, and written with this noble intention, that is, to encourage the faithful in the time of persecution and to support them under very severe trials. 
Accordingly, they see much of this book that meets with their approval and are fully aware and awake to its literary beauties, but all the same, it is in their eyes a mere work of the imagination, cleverly put together, but containing not a few historical inaccuracies, owing to its having been written some three or four hundred years after the time which it describes. To them, therefore, its great facts are pure fancies, its mighty miracles are feats of the imagination, its so-called prophecies are history clothed in a garb of prophecy, a favorable practice in the apocalypse of the pseudepigrapha. And again, that's a criticism that, that Charles Boutflowers is, is pointing out that some have with this book. If this is the case, how then did it end up in the canon of Scripture? We, we see in the New Testament, Jesus uh, refers to it and regards it with honor. How could he be mistaken or misleading? Certainly he wasn't. Dr. Uh, Edward B. Pusey said, The book of Daniel is especially fitted to be a battlefield with faith and unbelief. It admits no half measures. It is either divine or an imposture. It is interesting that when you look for God's hand at work and you have that walk with God, you see him at work everywhere. If you aren't looking for that hand, you see fate and uh, a degree of randomness that seems to be controlling everything. Even the believer that, that says, Lord, I, I need my, I challenge my faith and help me grow my faith. I'm having a hard time seeing you at work. I, I, I go into life and, and I'm not sure that you're actually in charge. That it seems like there are just some details of my life that you're, you're not in charge of. And, and, and I know you mean well, but there's just too much for you to keep track of. And of course, I know, part of me knows that by him all things consist. If he's holding an atom together on the other side of the universe, there isn't a detail of my life that he is not in charge of and aware of. This is an exciting book because either God's in charge of everything or he isn't. And of course, uh, I say he is, but there's that, fallen, there's that fallen part of me that doesn't see God at work all the time. And then there's the unsaved people that, that don't see God in anything, the natural man that discerneth not the, the, the spiritual matters of God's word. With a book as great as Daniel, one should expect the echo of the evil one. Yea, hath God said. Let us turn instead to this great book. Um, the God-breathed Holy Spirit's book. This authentic an authoritative account of Daniel the prophet as the Lord Jesus himself described him. And here instead of, hath the Lord said, let's hear instead, yea, hath God said, thus saith the Lord. Secondly, in this introduction, I'd like to point out the authorship and the date. Now internally, Daniel said that he wrote it. So, uh, Daniel 12.4. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. So the words were given to Daniel, and he was supposed to care for them. Uh, now, Daniel wrote in the first person. Uh, look at uh, Daniel 9, 2. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books. Uh, we can also see uh, 8, 1. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. You can also look up chapter 9, verse 20, and chapter 10, verse 2. So there's internal evidence that Daniel was the author. 
Daniel was a contemporary with the Babylonian and Persian reigns over Israel. Jesus spoke of a historic Daniel, we referred to that a few moments ago, who foretold the abomination of desolation. So uh, he did foretell the abomination of desolation in Daniel 9.27. Uh, let's turn there. Daniel 9.27 and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Also, uh, you can look up uh, chapter 11, verse 31. We'll get there together. And chapter 12, verse, uh, chapter 12, verse 11. Now let's, let's look. So Jesus spoke these words in Matthew 24. So certainly, if you understand Jesus to be who the Bible says he is, God the Son, then he will not make a mistake as to give honor to this book of Daniel if it's a fraud. Matthew 24, 15. And in my Bible, these words are in red. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy, in the holy place. Um, and then verse 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Let me look over with uh, Matthew 27, 64 as well. Again, these words are in red. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. So he mentions Daniel by name, and then uh, these two other times refers back to his book. I think, as far as Daniel being a fraud, I, I think that ends it all right there. Ezekiel also spoke of him as being a contemporary. So uh, there in Ezekiel 14.14, 14, Ezekiel 14.14, 14, Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. And then verse 20, 14, 20. Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter, they shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. Not to say that here Noah and, and uh, Job are contemporaries, they weren't. But for this Daniel, um, who would have the, the critics say that he existed hundreds of years later, or uh, somebody taking on that name, here he, he would have had to have existed um, at least within Ezekiel's lifetime for him to know about him, because they don't say that he existed hundreds of years before. Even though he was a contemporary, Ezekiel grouped him with the men of great faith who were from the past. He regarded him highly. Ezekiel thought him the epitome of wisdom. Uh, Ezekiel 28, verse 3. Uh, so let me see what Ezekiel says about that. Ezekiel 28, verse 3. It says, Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that can hide from thee. So um, the fact that Daniel was someone to be compared to as far as wisdom and it was amazing that, that, that uh, there could be anyone wiser than Daniel. And so he was kind of placed here as the standard. The book, so the date, the book will cover 605 B.C., that's Daniel's deportation, uh, till 535 B.C., the third year of Cyrus, chapter 10, verse 1. And Daniel would have written it over the course of his lifetime. So... As far as uh, doing your own study, I could recommend uh, 
a book uh, from the late Sir Robert Anderson's uh, little book, Daniel in the Critic's Den. The attack was led with Origen's allegorical pupil, Porphyry, who wrote 15 books against the Christians. He said that Daniel was not a prophecy, but a forgery written in the 500, not in the 500s, but in 165 BC. Now, the Roman emperor Theodosius II had this, uh, this man's works destroyed in 448 BC, but the German rationalists have taken up the mantle since, mantle since then. All right, so a little bit of criticism about the book and the, the authorship and the date. But now let's look at Daniel the man for a little bit. Born around 620 BC and then deported in 605 BC. BC. Um, this was one of the deportations. Nebuchadnezzar came uh, a couple of other times in, in 597 later on in 586. This time, Daniel was pro probably a teenager, a 15 or 16 year old. Uh, by the end, during the reign of Cyrus, he was probably in his 90s. Dan L. Dan L. Dan, the tribe of Dan, has the idea of judgment. El is that name of God, Elohim. And uh, you, you have that, that idea of Dan L. God is my judge. I haven't done it yet, but. I've always, I've always thought it might be fun to, to put together a, a sermon and look at the tribe of Dan and see how when, when they have judgment apart from God, how did that tribe fare? And then Dan, L, Dan L, when God is my judge, when I live according to his righteous judgment and living to please him, uh, I thought it'd be fun to, to the Dan L, though that E-L at the end is very important, where God is my judge. Judgment isn't enough, but God is my judge, and then we're ready to live our life. He'll be my judge in this life or the next. Um, <laughs> uh, I want to pretend like he's my judge now and not pretend. I want to live like it so that I'm ready for the next. He is my judge. Now, Daniel has been compared to John the Beloved. John the Beloved, and here's why. Let's get back to Daniel. See if I, if I can read these verses and, and you see if you can tell why he would be compared to John the Beloved. Uh, I start with Daniel 9.23. Daniel 9.23. See if this reminds you of John the Beloved. And it says this, At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Uh, then chapter 10, verse 11 and he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved. Then a little later on in that chapter, verse 19. And he said, O man greatly beloved. Hopefully it's obvious why people compare him with John the beloved. Others have uh, compared him to Joseph. Joseph, um, they were both slaves. Uh, they both interpreted dreams. They were both prophetic. They were both favored by their masters. Uh, they were both taken as youths. Um, they were both in a pit. <laughs> Joseph's didn't have lions in it, but they were both in a pit. Uh, they were both hated by their peers. They were both falsely accused. Joseph uh, in Potiphar's house, uh, he was lied about and uh, and. Daniel, falsely accused, uh, not that he wasn't falsely accused, he, he really was worshiping God, but the idea that, that he, he was not loyal to the king. The truth is, the loyalty that is left over after you place your primary loyalty in God, that's the very best loyalty. Truth be told, those men that, that, that brought charges against Daniel, they were the ones that were, they were living this life for themselves. They were not loyal to their king. Especially knowing that their king loved Daniel. Knowing that he loved Daniel, they were going against their king, saying that they were loyal and Daniel was not. Falsely accused. And then uh, Joseph had his divining cup, um, which was, uh, he had that cup from Egypt, and, and, uh, and uh, uh, Daniel was in that world as well. 
but he, of course, the both of them placed their faith in, in Jesus, or in God. Okay, um, now back to Daniel. Uh, he was, he had a royal heritage. Um, uh, chapter 1, verse 3, we see that, that he was part of a group that was selected because they were unique. Chapter 1, verse 3, And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel, uh, and of the king's seed, and of the princes. So um, there, there, was, there were special people that were, that were brought to him. He had a royal heritage, and it seems that he had godly parents. Um, there's, a, there's some verses that we can look at. In, in 2 Kings chapter 20, verses 17 and 18, uh, there's a prediction that the descendants of Hezekiah would be eunuchs in Babylon. You can also cross-reference Isaiah 39, verses 6 and 7. Now, in comparing uh, Jeremiah 26, 16, and these passages with Daniel 1, 1, it seems that Daniel had that royal lineage, probably a descendant of Hezekiah, and his lineage were also, it seems like he had a God-fearing father. Um, in looking at these passages, it seems like there's a very good chance that his father was one of the ones that stood for the Lord in certain times. In fact, I've heard a message by one of the men here at the church, uh, instead of dare to be a Daniel, the message was dare to be a Daniel's father. And I'm a dad. I've got a boy and, and two girls, and it's a scary thought. What if I'm taken before I train them uh, to the point where they're ready to do something for God? And when will that be? My son is 10. My daughter is eight, and my youngest daughter is, is five. If I was taken now, what would happen to my family? Well, some of those things are outside of my control. I could be taken. Uh, things could happen. Here was a situation where Daniel's father seems to have invested in him a heart of character and uh, an appreciation for the importance of a walk with God. So that being carried off into captivity, he was able to purpose in his heart not to defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, to not live for the pleasures of this world. For that reason, he also reminds us of Moses. Moses had access to the pleasures of this world, and he turned his back on some of those. Here, Daniel didn't turn his back on, the, on this life uh, around royalty, but he did tur turn his back on some of the pleasures of the life surrounded by royalty. So, he uh, dared to be a Daniel's father. Uh, back to Daniel, next thing, he, he wrote his first six chapters in the third person, uh, as though speaking historically. The last chapters, verses chapter 7 through 12, are written in the, in the first person, as though speaking prophetically. And then, as far as prophecy is concerned, more is said about the tribulation and antichrist than in any other Old Testament book. It is the only book to use the term Messiah. Nearly 40 fulfilled prophecies are in chapter 11 alone, more than any other chapter in the Bible. <clears throat> also, with Daniel, he lived in or near Jerusalem before he was carried into captivity. We see he was a good man, uh, a man of purpose, chapter 1, a man of prayer, chapter 6, and a man of prophecy, chapter 7 through 12. We see a couple angels ministering to him, um, Gabriel in chapter 9, verse 21, and Michael, chapter 10, verse 13. We see victory in this book. Uh, we see victory over human cravings in chapter 1. Oh, but if I don't enjoy the pleasures of this life, what else is there? Well, Daniel shows us there's plenty. There's plenty in just following the Lord, making Him our chief joy. And if I can't have this special uh, food and drink, it doesn't matter. I have access to my chief joy, and that's plenty for me. I tell you, if we had more of that, we'd have a lot, a lot more happy Christians and productive Christians, because God can use a person like that. 
Oh God, you are my treasure. If I have nothing else but you, that's already more than I deserve. We also see the victory over pagan magic in chapter 2. We see victory over idolatry, chapter 3. We see victory over pagan pride in chapter 4. Over sacrilege in chapter 5. Over malicious plotting, chapter 6. That reminds me again, we, we just said it, but with Joseph in Potiphar's house. Uh, she lied about him and he ended up in jail. Oh, how powerless we are. Sure, I'll give you that. We're powerless. But we get to walk through this life with one that's all powerful. And well, you see a Joseph and you think, oh my God, what if? What, what, what do you mean, what if? <laughs> what if something happens today you didn't know about? What if something happens that's outside of your control? Well, guess what? I did know about it and it's under my control. Just walk through your day with me and acknowledge me in all your ways and let me direct your paths. It's exciting to be a Christian, but how easy it is we forget those things. The revival of Josiah uh, would have affected him, even though it didn't even affect Josiah's children. Josiah actually died four years before the captivity. And then uh, as far as how he affected Babylon, how he affected Babylon, Daniel. Well, how did Daniel affect Babylon? Well, he vindicated the power of God there. Even if it gives the world cause to mock him, God punishes his own when they need it. Oh God, you can't punish me. I belong to you. And what will people think? And God says, I, I'm going to do right. and I'm going to judge righteous judgment. I'm not really too concerned about what people think. All right. I'm concerned about what I think. Um, and, and God punished his people. In time, those who would look down upon him for not uplifting his people, despite their sin, will see him for who he is. He, uh, so back to Daniel, Daniel was able to provide better living conditions for the Jews. They were allowed to worship God some and were able to succeed. So probably uh, the, the way the different kings viewed Daniel uh, allowed Daniel's people to enjoy better living conditions. Daniel didn't necessarily, and he had a lot of responsibilities, I believe, with, uh, with the affairs of state and different things he was involved in. He put those limitations on himself as far as the king's uh, food and drink. But I tell you, he made those sacrifices and I believe a lot of people got to enjoy a better life, uh, um, different living conditions because of him. Okay, and then let's talk about the historical background. What's the historical setting of this time? Well, uh, let's go back to Genesis 12, first of all. We see that God promised uh, the, the land of Israel to his chosen people. Um, Deuteronomy 28, uh, in those chapters in there, 29, 30, God says, and I, I, I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. If, uh, if you'll obey me and be true to me, no one will be able to stand against you. But if you forget me, and live like I don't exist, and follow idols, um, you'll be easy prey for your enemies in this world. And in fact, I'll bless your enemies so that they can especially have the power and strength to overcome you. And that's what happened. Um, Israel rebelled against, um, uh, against the Assyrians and were carried off in 722. Egypt was a, a world power, but a little while later, they were pushed aside by the, the new powerful nation of Babylon. Um, when, when Babylon defeated Israel, at, or I'm sorry, Egypt at Carchemish in 605. You can put down this passage, Jeremiah 46, 3 through 12. So Daniel and his three friends were carried off in 605 BC. BC. Jehoiachin is defeated and carried off along with Ezekiel in 597. And then Zedekiah is defeated. Um, Jerusalem's overthrown in 586 BC. Uh, 2 Kings 24 and 25 and Jeremiah 39 and 52. Josiah, a godly king, would have been reigning at the time of Daniel's birth. Um, 
Jehoiakim would have been reigning when Daniel was carried off. And there's a, all sorts of history about Josiah and Jehoiakim. Jeremiah prophesied from 627 to 586, so right in that time period. Jeremiah 1 2. Um, Daniel probably got a chance to hear him preach. At the very least, we know he did have a copy of his book. Uh, Daniel was able to read Jeremiah somehow. Daniel 9, 1 through 2. The information that he comes, he's reading this book. Um, in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understand, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet. So he was able to read Jeremiah and understand some things about, how, about God's workings through time. So uh, Nebuchadnezzar was in power when Daniel was carried off. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar uh, means, O oh, Nabu, protect my offspring. And Nebuchadnezzar, and, and then other places, he's called Nebuchadrezzar, which is, uh, there, are, there are philological uh, or linguistic reasons for that. Uh, but Nebuchadnezzar was in power when Daniel was carried off. He was succeeded by his son, evil Merodach, uh, 2 Kings 25, 27 through 30 who was assassinated by Nereglasar within two years. Nabonidus was made the new king with Belshazzar as his co-regent. And that's what's going on in Daniel chapter 5. Uh, when you see that chapter, there's all these things that had transpired between the beginning of Daniel and Daniel 5. The Medo-Persians took over in 539 BC. Okay. What, uh, what are the purposes of the book of Daniel? Well, uh, it's exciting to see that, that God is sovereign. God is sovereign. That we don't have to worry about things. That um, the thing that we can't stand is God's creativity. I love God's creativity when he's doing it with other people. Personally, I want to know what he's going to do. Um, when, 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 again, with a Joseph, um, how creative was that to, to land him in jail and from there make him the second? We don't, we wouldn't want, we wouldn't have preferred, that's not how I would have written it. <laughs> but how beautifully creative was God and being able to, through all of that, bring uh, Jacob and the family there to Israel so they could grow into a nation. God is so creative that it's, it's looking back. They were like, oh, what beautiful creativity. But then we pick something from the past and we go, God, that's how I want you to work in my life. Well, again, he's so creative that he's got whole brand new ways of working in my life. He could do this and this and this and do something completely different because he doesn't run out of ideas. <laughs> he's that creative. I think of the snowflake and how many different variations of the snowflake. And some have even said that no two snowflakes are exactly the same. If God can redesign every snowflake that comes down, then he's mind-blowingly creative. And he wants to work. And he can work. And he's sovereign. And just this books like this where you say, oh, God, I wouldn't have done it that way. But wow, that's amazing the way that worked out. The sovereignty of God over the course of human history, including the future in its entirety. <laughs> To some degree, uh, everything from, from uh, uh, through the days of the Gentiles, I mean, just the whole future is laid out in this book. It's very interesting in chapter 4, verse 17 and 25 and 32. Man's pride, uh, in the case of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, man's impiety, in the case of Belshazzar, man's blasphemy, in the case of Darius, all of these are brought low. God continually shows himself as the king of kings. And then he has, to, he has to remind us over and again in the book of Daniel, as, as Nebuchadnezzar says, wow, there's no God like your God. And then it seems like a little while later, he's like, and who is that God that will deliver you out of my hand? It's like, you, you, you forgot the guy that you just said. There was nobody like him. 
Um, we human beings are numbskulls. <laughs> and uh, what, a, what an exciting book as we study God's sovereignty. Man is always held responsible for his own actions. Uh, another idea, so that's an idea in, in, in this book. Another idea, even in captivity, God still has a, a plan for Israel. The miracles would have bolstered the faith of those who are trying to do right. I don't know, I, I think of the little maid in Naaman's home. She was carried off and, and the temptation would have been, well, I'm not in the land of promise and I wonder if God's promises are, are done anyway. Maybe, maybe God meant well, but he lost control of things and it doesn't matter for me anyhow. I'm, I'm out of the land of promise. My life has taken a different direction and, and obviously God isn't concerned with me. And, well, she didn't have that spirit. We see that to her, God was precious and the man of God was precious. And she told, told the, the, the mistress, uh, oh, would to God that, that you had a man of God like we do who, could, who was able to help. Um, I, these people in captivity were carried off and they needed some bolstering that God still had a plan for them and that God was still all powerful as, as they thought, well, I, I kind of thought God was going to do something through those people, but we aren't a people really anymore. We've been carried off and assimilated into other cultures. And, and really, they weren't. In Babylon, they were able to uh, maintain that certain distinction. When Assyria carried the northern kingdom off, they were kind of assimilated into the world uh, and to the different cultures, and they did kind of disappear. Back in Israel with the Samaritans, as they brought in other, land, other peoples and they mixed and became the Samaritans, um, that, that identity did kind of go away. Israel was disappearing, but the portion that was carried into Babylon, they didn't that God was able to allow them to maintain their identity and, and continue to be a people. And then as they came back, you still had a people. So that's some of the, the purpose of this book. I know even for us today, it's very encouraging. Um, let's look at the language for just a moment. This book, you, you'd say, well, the New Testament is written in Greek and the Old Testament is in Hebrew. Well, that's basically correct. That's basically correct. But uh, this book here, there's a large uh, section of it that is uh, written in Aramaic. Aramaic, and, and he calls it the Syriac. The Syriac in here. Um, the Hebrew language is found in chapter one, uh, ver chapter 1, verse 1, through chapter 2, verse 4a, and then the last part of the book from chapter 1, 8 through 12, 13. The, the, the center of this book is written in Aramaic, chapter 2, verse 4b, through chapter 7, verse 24. So a large chunk of the middle of this book is written in Aramaic. Aramaic was the lingua franca of Daniel's day. Lingua franca, this, this has the idea of a bridge language, a language that would bridge the gap between peoples whose native tongues were different a common language or a trade slash uh, commercial language, uh, also known as Syriac. It's uh, also found in Genesis 31, verse 47, uh, as well as Ezekiel 4, 8 through 6 and 18 and 7, 12 through 16 and Jeremiah 10, verse 11. Um, for this reason, because it was the lingua franca of his day, it seemed to be the language of choice for Daniel's memoirs and information about the Gentile people. So this, this book of Daniel contains information about the times of the Gentiles. Uh, it, has, it has information for the Jews. So it seems like Daniel kind of uh, took the, the, the information for the times of the Gentiles and kind of uh, put, put some of that in the language, the, the trade language of the Gentiles of that day, and, and then maybe the, the, the sections that were more for the Hebrew-speaking people uh, kept those in Hebrew. Okay, so we'll conclude this introduction with uh, just a little bit about some related kings. First of all, uh, some related kings to this time period. Let, let's start with uh, the, the kingdom of Judah. What were some related kings there? Well, Jehoahaz, 609 to 608, Jehoiakim, 
608 to 597, Jehoiachin, 597, and Zedekiah, 597 through 586. So here are some people that would have been uh, living around this time. Uh, and then in Babylon, there would have been one king, um, one main king, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, of course, real quickly, you have uh, Belshazzar, uh, but Nebuchadnezzar, uh, 605 to 562. And then uh, Belshazzar loses the kingdom when the Medo-Persians come in. And so here are some kings here, uh, Cyrus, 558 to 529, uh, and, and Darius. And again, there is some, was Darius Cyrus? Was this Darius the first, Darius the second? Um, but we'll get into some of that. But Darius from 522 to 485. And then Xerxes, 485 to 464. Um, and then it's, it's, it's a little while later, but, th but through prophecy, uh, Macedonia slash Greece is one of the related kingdoms with Alexander in, uh, in five, uh, 356 through 323. All right, so that's just a little bit of the introduction of this book. Uh, with the next session, we'll, we'll get into uh, chapter one. And of course, the first half of the book uh, is all the exciting stories. And the second half is, is the prophecy. But, but mark my words, the last half of the book has uh, some excitement all its own. And I'm going to enjoy going through this book with you. My son, as I mentioned before, is 10 years old. And he loves to read books about great men who have done great things. And when it comes time to do his chores, though, he wants to disappear with his book. <laughs> and of course, as a father, I like to tell him, son, you like to read about men doing great things. At some point, you're going to have to put down your book and do some great things. And it starts with obedience. So don't disobey and then slink off into the shadows with your book to read about men who obeyed. Be one of those men who obeyed. Be one of the men that did something right for God and stood for Him. The reason why I tell you that story is because as we study Daniel, he and, and his uh, Hebrew friends, and of course the other Bible characters of the, of the Bible, they were men that were willing to, to risk everything and stand for God. As we tackle this book, let's make a determination that as we study it, we also will dare to be a Daniel. 